Hi there, Fiddler Dan here, and today I want to talk about uh, violin bows. And I have a, a selection here, as well as some rosins that I'm going to talk about. So this might be five or six minutes of your life that you don't get back, but I hope you'll hang in there if you want to find out more about violin bows. So a violin bow is much more than a stick. It uh, carries the vibrations of the strings through the wood and helps produce the sound. So it actually is responsible for half of the sound on your violin. So it's, uh, it's very important and how it's made can greatly affect the sound. Violin bows come uh, either as a disposable type like this, uh, and you can see on the mounting block there, uh, there's actually no way to get into that. Through to a mounted frog like this, uh, where you can see pieces here, so you can take that apart and put in a new bow here. In actual fact, to rehair a bow is uh, kind of a specialist job and, and takes maybe uh, three quarters to, a, to an hour for someone that knows what they're doing. So rehairing a bow costs uh, somewhere around $100, and if you're a student, you can buy a student bow for uh, 50 bucks. So Usually and unfortunately, uh, it just means you go and buy yourself a new bow. So what to look at in a bow, uh, particularly if you're looking at uh, a second-hand violin, you want to make sure that there's plenty of hair in the bow. So this is an example of plenty of hair. It's coming out all the way to the edge of the uh, man mounting fur roll there. And this is one here where it's starting to lose some of its hair. Um, it's also a bit dirty here. We can clean that up quite easily. That's not a problem, but the loss of hair is a problem. If you're just starting out, this bow is probably okay, but once you've been going a while, uh, you definitely want something with a, with a full head of hair, uh, unlike myself. So uh, some of the important characteristics of a violin bow, uh, is, it, is it stiff enough? This one's quite a bendy bow. I'm just bending that with my hand here. That's quite bendy. That means when I try to put my uh, force or expression into the bow, the bow bends a lot and um, is not able to transmit the force all that well into the bow hair itself. So how bendy the bow or how stiff the bow is, is quite important. If you're just starting out, uh, quite a bendy bow is okay because it means that while your technique hasn't quite been sorted out, uh, it's going to be a whole lot more forgiving. But when it comes time to putting more expression into the bow, it's going to be more difficult because you can't transmit a the force necessary for um, for the dynamics of the music uh, or the the variability of the force throughout the bow stroke so that you can produce a nice tone. Other things to watch out for in uh, in new bows. You'll often, uh, in second-hand bows, you'll often see some damage like here. That's, that's come off. That's cosmetic, so it's not actually a problem if you're just getting started. I wouldn't worry about that too much. Another thing to watch out for is a common breaking point is, uh, and you can just see a faint line there. I've actually repaired this bow, but you can see a faint line there. Uh, this is where they break because the grain of the timber goes this way, and so it's, that's the weakest point there because it's the thinnest amount of wood and it's more likely to, to break there, particularly if it's, if it's dropped or um, sword fights if you have uh, young boys. So here are some, uh, some new bows that I stocked. This is a student bow and this will do you quite well for, for quite a period of time, at least the three, first three years of your learning. Uh, they roll in at around, uh, around 50 bucks. And they're a great way to uh, upgrade your second-hand instrument if you want to get uh, a bit more from it. Then we start to step up in the in the range of bows, and this is a this is a better bow. And while it looks almost identical, um, it's a whole lot stiffer, and so you're going to get a much better tone from that bow. Then we start to move up through uh, a different range of materials. Uh, this is an FPS fine bow, so still nominally uh, Brazil wood, but it has um, it has a much nice, nicer patina to it. So it's it's just a better selected grade of wood, 
uh, for stiffness and that usually corresponds into a change in its appearance as well. That's a lot stiffer. That'll do you for quite a while. When you're ready, you probably want to step up to something like a, a Pernambuco bow. This is my bow at the moment. It's a Dorfler. Uh, these come in, uh, Pernambuco bows start to come in around $800 and, uh, and much, much higher. Uh, some of the guidelines around uh, how much you should spend on a bow, say uh, approximately a third of the value of the violin. And uh, until you've played with one of these bows, you probably won't, won't believe that that's what I'm saying is, is quite accurate or true. So Pernambuco is uh, an endangered timber, but it's, it's really stiff yet uh, really supple. Uh, and uh, I've actually measured the vibrations in the bow and they correspond to the vibrations in a, in a violin string. Uh, and not just at the um, fundamental frequency of the note, but up, up around the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th and 10th order harmonics. They really convey those high frequencies very well down the bow and feed them back into the violin. And that's why you can get such tremendous tone out of these more expensive bows. Because Pernambuco is um, an endangered wood um, and one of its main properties is its stiffness, We've been able to replicate that. When I say we, I mean the modern world has been able to replicate that using carbon fibre. Uh, and this is a woven carbon fibre bow that I carry. And uh, the wonderful thing about carbon fibre is that uh, you can make it as, just about as stiff as you like um, using the fibres. I've This bow that I've chosen here has a diamond weave pattern. And uh, not only does it look lovely, uh, because of the diamond weave, it just seems to convey those um, those vibrations uh, a little bit better. So you get the stiffness, uh, but also the vibrations. One of the challenges with the carbon fiber bow is that the carbon fiber is held together with epoxy and um, epoxy kind of dampens those vibrations. So the more carbon fiber in a bow, the better it's gonna convey those uh, vibrations as well as the stiffness. So that's why some of the carbon fiber bows uh, can be almost as expensive as the Pernambuco bows. But in general, you're getting uh, two or three times the value uh, or bang for your buck with a carbon fiber bow uh, with the uh, equivalent uh, Pernambuco bow. So uh, I sell this one for uh, just over a hundred bucks, $140, I think. And I think this performs close to a three or four hundred dollar bow. It doesn't quite have the same uh, sensitivity as the more expensive bows, but um, if you're looking for that dynamic range, particularly if you're playing in other genres of music uh, beyond classical, uh, then this is what you have. And I actually, for my playing, I actually have two bows in my case. I have the uh, the Pernambuco for um, when I have the really expressive music, and then I have the carbon fiber for when I'm playing um, the the louder and, and the rougher music, say from the country and, uh, and rock traditions. So um, your mileage may vary, um, much like there is a, a range of bows here. Uh, they're a really cheap way to upgrade your instrument if you want to get uh, a better sound out of it. The other thing that's quite important is the rosin that you use on the bow. Rosin is what helps the horsehair grip the strings. Horsehair has uh, very fine um, scales in it, if you like. Essentially, it's hair, uh, horse's hair, and um, the rosin controls how much it grips and how much it slips. And it's the slip grip combination of the bow on the strings that uh, allows it to produce all of those different frequencies. So uh, when you're a beginner, the beginner rosin doesn't matter too much. I usually supply this rosin with, um, with my secondhand instruments. It's a very basic rosin. Uh, then students tend to move up to something like this. This is around ten dollars. Very basic, uh, very ba basic rosin, but uh, is somewhat better than the other one. And then the personality of rosin starts to come in. And so we have rosins like uh, the Tomastic, Tomastic people uh, make their uh, dominant rosin. It's quite a nice uh, sticky rosin. Uh, this is my favourite rosin, the uh, Perastro Olive Eva, because I run the Eva Perezzi strings. Uh, and it's um, it allows you to produce uh, really nuanced tones. So I like that rosin on my uh, Pernambuco bow. 
And this is a favorite uh, soloist's bow, the uh, Celia Rosin. Um, it's, uh, it's recently had a name change, but that's the name there, and that's a very hard rosin. So I use that on my, um, on my carbon fiber bow, and that allows me to get a fantastic dominant response, uh, fantastic dynamic response uh, from my bow, and uh, it's the preferred one for my carbon fiber bow. So there you have it, um, a range of bows, and when you, when you first start out, you won't notice the difference, but as you start to play more, you'll start to discover, hey, I, need, I think I need a better bow, or I need to experiment with some different rosins, uh, and then there's strings, and that's a whole lovely uh, rabbit hole that you can go down with, because you're changing your strings every year after all. So uh, you can experiment with different strings, different rosins, and upgrade your bows as you go. Thanks for listening if you've made it this far. Oh, that's gone to 11 minutes, and uh, see you next time. Bye for now.